to worship here at Christ United Methodist Church. I hope you're staying warm enough. I think you could all uh, raise a hand, raise a hand with me, and then you can pat yourself on the back <laughs> for getting up this morning. I know that as much as I love you and this place, it was really challenging to get out of my nice warm bed on this very cold day. So we hope that you find yourself to feel incredibly welcome and warm in this space. One way that we try to make sure that everyone feels seen and known is by filling out the attendance pads that we pass down the aisle. So if you will, at least on your names, so that we know you're here, or else if you want more information about what's going on here at Christ Church, uh, you can fill out your email or your phone number, and we'd be happy to check in with you. We have a couple of guests with us today. We have uh, Jeff Dane on the organ, who is fantastic, and we can welcome Jeff this morning. John Verona is amazing, and he is taking a well-deserved vacation. Uh, we also have the Reverend Cynthia Williams here this morning, who is uh, my boss, so be very, very nice to her. Um, and we can welcome Cynthia. She also braved the cold to be here this morning, and she will be bringing the message, which is a, a fabulous gift. She's a gifted preacher. So uh, we also have a lot of other announcements and things going on. One thing is just to remind you that we do not necessarily go with the school system. When the school system is closed, uh, we're not necessarily closed as a church. So keep checking on the KTTC website. Keep checking on our church Facebook even if you don't have Facebook, you can, you can go to the church Facebook page and it'll let you know if any of the events are being canceled due to weather. Make sure that you stay safe. Uh, you need, if you need to stay at home for a meeting or an event, you do that. We want people to stay safe in this community. We also want to let you know we have lots and lots of small groups still going on and a lot of them are gearing up for this winter semester. Uh, you could bang on a drum with Steve Barlow, which I've been walking by that classroom, and that looks like it is a very, it sounds like it's a very good time. And there's many other classes that you can be involved in. This is how we show and grow and demonstrate how it is that we are the people of Christ, by being in groups, in community with one another, who live life together. So sign up for a small group. If you've never done it before, I promise you, there is one for everyone. So, as you consider the ways you are gifted and involved in this place, will you rise and sing with us and call, as we call ourselves into worship? <coughs>
Will you join with me in prayer? Our God of all life, we are grateful for all things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small. We are thankful for the field mouse and the snow fox, the great horned owls, the sound of the wind, the ice crystals. We're thankful for sunlight in the midwinter. We're thankful for gatherings and worship and beautiful music and cavernous spaces, the sounds of children laughing for bright lights and clear blue glass. We're thankful for good work and another day, another month, another year to live and breathe and work in. God, we're thankful for grandparents and grandchildren, those connected by family and those connected by community. We're thankful that we have so much to learn from each other of all ages and stages of life. We are inspired by the energy of our children and youth who want to do good work and change the world. And we pray and trust they will. And we're thankful for the wisdom of our elders for their assurance that all will be well, for their passion and intentionality. We're thankful for our sisters up at Assisi Heights who care and are hosting a gathering for those struggling with immigration issues. We pray that we might stop seeing one another as enemies and come together as one family, black, white, brown, rich, poor. Be with us as we are here to worship you, God, with our whole hearts and minds and souls. Help us to be here now. Open our ears and our eyes. Be thou our vision. And as these people who seek to see and know and love you, we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
like to invite the children forward for our time with children this morning. And as you come up, I want you to take a good look around because I have a quiz for you. So look around you, look around you as you walk. Yes, you can keep your eyes open while you're walking and look around. What do you see? Notice. Notice what's going on around you. All right, and then once you're sitting down over here, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes, and I'm going to see what you noticed when your eyes were open. So now that you know what's going to happen, maybe you want to keep your eyes open for another few seconds. Good morning. Yeah, you can bring your sister over. You are matching, and I love that. Cynthia and I are sort of matching too, right? We get to wear robes together. All right, so let's have our eyes closed. Can you close your eyes once you're sitting down? Close your eyes once you're sitting down. Okay, I want to know what color, close your eyes, what color robe, if you know the answer, raise your hand, what color robe is Pastor Cynthia wearing? What color? What color? Black. You got black. Good job. All right, keep your eyes closed. Keep your eyes closed. Okay. What is the color of, what are one of the colors in the stained glass window behind us? What's one of the colors? What about you? Blue. Blue. Good job. You got that. I mean, that one, there's a lot of colors in there, so you could kind of just guess any color. So that was, that's a little bit of a giveaway one, right? Okay. How about what color is my stole that I'm wearing, the thing I wear over my robe. Oh, what color? Green. Green. They can't tell that I'm holding the microphone to them. That's, I just realized that. <laughs> so I try to hold it up to them and they're like, I don't know. Say it, say it again, my dear. Green. Green, good job, that's excellent. All right, let's see, one more thing that you could identify. How about what color is the stuff hanging behind the altar over there? There was, oh, don't look, don't look, your eyes are closed still. What is something, what color, does anyone know? Raise your hand if you know. Or what color? What color is it? What color is it? Do you know? You can peek, I'll let you have a peek. Can you see it back there? All right, everyone open your eyes. Now you can look around and see. There's like a blue, silvery hanging. Isn't it pretty? What does it remind you of? Like a mermaid, like water. Yeah, isn't that cool? Well, good job playing this game with me. Isn't it kind of funny how you think you know everything when your eyes are open, and then as soon as they're closed, you start to kind of question some of the stuff you are seeing. Why is it important to pay attention to the world around you? What color did you see, Lex? What? You saw white? Yeah, I'm wearing white. There is a lot of white around here, too. You're right about that. What is important about paying attention? Why should we pay attention to the world around us? What's good when we pay attention? You see good things. You get to see good things, right? Yeah, if you're not paying attention, maybe you didn't get to see how pretty Cynthia's nice shiny black robe is and you don't get to see the mermaid tail up there. You miss out on so much if you pay attention. Sometimes if you try to do too many things at once, it makes it kind of hard to pay attention, right? Have you ever tried to talk with someone while you're watching a movie or playing a game? How does that go? No one knows what I'm talking about. I'm just like, hey, in a minute. <laughs> hey, in a minute. No one knows what you're talking about because you get distracted so easily. Yes, right. What's up, Lex? So if you, if, when someone's saying something, you have to pay, pay attention in it and listen what they're saying. You are so right about that, Lex. That is a great statement. Shouldn't we pay attention when people are talking to us? Because they matter. When we see people, look at each other in the eyes. When you see each other and you see and you can say hi and people understand what you're saying, doesn't it feel good to know that people are listening to you? You have a question, Lex? So, it, it, if you pour bad water into plants, they die. If you pour good good water into plants? I think that's, that might be true. I think that's a really good idea, Lex. We want to take care of our plants and pay attention to our plants too, right? And pay attention to the things we put in our bodies, the things we do all around, we have to be careful and pay attention, right? So we get to pay attention to this beautiful world that God has created for us, and we get to pay attention to the beautiful things. So we want to make sure, next time you're tempted to play on your phone or play video games when people are talking, 
remember that you can just do one thing good at once, okay? All right, will you pray with me? We're gonna, we're gonna, you're going to repeat after me for this prayer, okay? Hey, God. You can join us. Hey, God. Thank you for bright colors. Thank you that we pay attention. Thank you for good words. Thank you for good wisdom. Amen. Awesome. It is so good to hang out with you all up here. I wish you could be here this whole time, but you have important Sunday school adventures to do. So our awesome flag holders over here will lead you on to a good and beautiful place. Thank you. Will you turn in your red United Methodist hymnal to 743? We're going to sing and read responsively. Response number one. is your name in all the earth. 
Your glory is chanted above the heavens by the mouth of babes and infants. You have set up a defense against your foes to still the enemy and the adventure. Look at your heavens, the work of your fingers. What are human beings that you are mindful of them? Yet you have made them little less than God. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. All sheep and oxen, and also the, beasts of the, field. the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea. O Lord, our Lord. This is a community that gives of itself generously in so many ways. Whether you are someone who plays beautiful music in this space, or you are someone who speaks truth to power in this community, you're someone who notices and pays attention to the ways and workings of this building and making sure that things go smoothly, you are a part of this family. So let us consider and pray over the ways we give and serve and give of ourselves generously in this time of offering.
together. We know that we each has, have different gifts. We all need each other. So we pray, God, that you take all that we offer, all that we are. Remind us that we are more than just an individual. We are part of something greater than ourselves. Use these gifts, bless them, and may they transform this church and this world. Amen. Good morning. Our scripture this morning comes from John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. So Lord God, this morning, how good it is to be in your house of worship. Lord, how good it is, Lord, uh, that even our very hearts and souls and senses, Lord, even now have been fed. And Lord, here we are, and we are before you, and you know us, and you know how we come. And so, Lord, we just simply ask that you would immerse us in your word, that your word would be bread for the journey. And so, Lord, we simply ask that you would speak to us, for we are your people and we are listening. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock, our strength, and our redeemer. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Years ago, during my uh, last year in seminary, I had a two-week cross-cultural immersion experience in Chicago in urban Chicago, but when I say urban Chicago, I don't mean Lincoln Park. I don't mean the Chicago Loop. I don't mean along the Magnificent Mile. What I mean is that I spent time two weeks in the places that you'll never read about in the travel brochures. <laughs> and on my first day, the director spoke on what it means to be a public theologian, theologians in the city. He said something that has stayed with me. He said that too often we think we are bringing God to the city. People come to serve and they come with an attitude that God is not present until they show up. <laughs> and I was reminded that we don't bring God to people. We don't bring God to the broken places. God is already present. Whether in the mission field in West Africa or in the homeless shelter outside the gates of the White House or around our family table, God is already there. Our work as God's people is to begin from a place of blessing. We are called and sent to name and lift and bless where we see God in the midst. We're also called to name and lift 
uh, when we see the counter forces of evil, to see it and name it and to stand against it in Jesus' name. In his power, we name and we call out strongholds and we work to tear them down. That's what we do as God's people, right? During a wedding celebration, the mother of Jesus, she sees something, she notices something, she sees that the wine has run out. And for a Jewish festival, the wine was essential. The rabbi says that without wine, there is no joy. <laughs> well, hospitality was this very sacred duty to run out of provision would have been a terrible humiliation. In the Bible, wine symbolizes fruitfulness and abundance, productivity. Uh, within this imagery, there is this communal aspect. And in the meta-narrative, the backdrop of a wedding feast signals new possibilities, new identities, new relationships, new chances for life in the world. In 1932, poet Langston Hughes painted a picture of a world that is like a wedding feast. He, he wrote, I dream a world where man, no other man will scorn where love will bless the earth and peace its paths adorn. I dream a world where all will know sweet freedom's ways, where greed no longer saps the soul, nor avarice blights our day. A world I dream, where black or white, whatever race you be, will share the bounties of the earth and every person is free. Whether wretchedness will hang its head and joy like a pearl, attends the needs of all mankind. Of such, I dream, my world. The idea of the wine running out is like a beautiful dream becoming a nightmare. In our world, in our communities, in our human family, the question before us today is where has the wine run out? In all the places where hope is struggling to be born, where has the wine run out? Langston Hughes, in response to his dream of a world, asked another question. He, he, he asked the question, what happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? Or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet. Maybe it just sags like a heavy load. Or does it, does it explode? On Monday, we celebrated the birth of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And Dr. J Dr. King dreamed of a world also. He dreamed of a world that is the beloved community that in many ways would be as a wedding feast a world where all people would have a seat at the table and a place in the banquet. My friends, my brothers and sisters today, while we have made gains, the dream is yet to be realized. There are still too many places where the wine has run out. There are too many people pushed further and further to the margins. While our national leaders fight over the wall, we already have walls. We have miles and miles of walls of racism and classism and sexism that contain and detain people from living into the fullness of who God has created each of us to be. Amen. We have too many children left vulnerable, isolated, cattled into detention centers, children into, moved into the system, covered in shrouds of fear, their futures altered and dreams dashed before they could even be fully formed. We have walls today. When you look at your community and your world, where do you see that the wine has run out? How shall we respond and what are we to do? I'm so glad that that's not the end of the story. Because as God's people, we have been given eyes to see and power to name and lift and proclaim that in these places, Jesus is still present. Jesus is still in the house. 
some years back, I was, uh, I had come home from a, a, a retreat and I had gotten my dog and my neighbor's dog and I headed out for a walk. It was this spring day and as I was walking, there was this woman sitting on a park bench and uh, she looked at me and she just lit up with glee and uh, she, was, she was actually beckoning me over because my neighbor's dog is this beautiful uh, little fluffy furball. And so she, she beckoned me over and she asked me what type of dog it was. And I said, well, she's a Havanese. She's a, a Cuban circus dog. So then she said, well, what kind of dog is your dog? And I said, well, my dog is a dachshund. He's German. And she says, ah, he's a Nazi. <laughs> I was like, no, he, he's not a Nazi. He's a good dog. <laughs> So we, she, so I, she asked if she could hold Lucy the furball, and so we sat down and we started this conversation. And and as we're talking, I don't know, uh, you know, I, I, it's hard for me to be in conversation with people and not mention God, right? Or or maybe she asked me what I do for a living, and I said I was a pastor. And if you ever want to clear a room, just walk in and say you're a pastor. <laughs> and so as soon as I said something about God, she said God. <laughs> She says, I want nothing to do with God. So I was like, oh, you know, the conversation just turned. And so I was like, I just started praying silently, like, what do I say to this woman? And so I just kept silent, and her story just poured out. And so she told me she had this accent, and I found out that she was from Russia. And she said she had grown up in communist Russia, and growing up there, uh, she talked about the brutality, and she talked about how the police had come to her apartment and yanked her 18-year-old brother out of the house, pulled him into the street, and they shot and killed him. And then she says to me, your country, it's no better. And then she tells me, she says, I've been in the same apartment for 15 years, and yes, I've hung pictures over the time, but the landlord won't give me my deposit back. And she looked at me and she said, where is your God in that? And so I looked at her in silence initially, and I thought, and I said, you know where my God was? You know where my God is? My God was right in the midst, is right in the midst of the injustice, weeping, weeping with you. And something broke, and it seemed like everything kind of changed, and some of her anger dissipated. And I don't believe that it totally answered all her questions that day, but to know that it made all the difference in the world, that she was not alone, that God weeps with us when we face injustice. And so what I believe today is that we find ourselves in these places where the transforming grace of Jesus is very present to work in miraculous ways in our lives and in our world. And, and this is what I believe too. As I've sat with this text today, I believe we are the water jars. I believe we are the water jars that Jesus uses. We have been transformed that we might be the hands and feet of Christ to bring light to darkness, to speak truth to power, and to extend grace upon grace upon grace. We are the ones who must raise our voices to raise consciousness because when we raise consciousness, it is the starting place of doing the work of justice. And so I wonder today what it would be like for us to see ourselves as God's water jars. What if we were to see these old clay jars fully alive and animated, uniquely formed, fashioned, gifted, and called. I wonder what it would be to see ourselves as water jars, God's people, the body of Christ, no two alike, standing together, transformed vessels, filled, transformed with beautiful wine, using our hands and feet and minds to be the change, the very change we desire to see in the world. Because I believe fully that God desires that we live abundantly, that we live as vessels of love and peace and reconciliation, as yielded vessels. We open ourselves. I believe that something happens when we make the decision to live in the state of yes. When we, we make the decision to live in the state of yes to the God who has already said yes to us. When we open ourselves to being and seeing with new eyes, we come open and trusting, believing, even when we don't know how God's going to do it. 
And we don't know when Jesus is going to do it, but we are certain that God will work it out. God can work it through us, inadequate us, questioning us, often fearful us to be the bearers and activators of dreams made real in the world. Jesus said when he is lifted, he will draw us close to himself. When we name and we lift Jesus and when we open ourselves to the yes of God, we will go where we've never been and we will do what we've never dreamed we could be, do, be done. And when we live life in the key of yes, we will give ourselves more than we've ever, ever given ourselves before. We will surrender what we've held tightly and love those we never thought we could love. When Jesus is in the house, we will forgive those we failed to forgive him, and we will trust God for what we never trusted God for before, and we will become what we never, ever, ever imagined we could be. And so this day, I pray that we would continue to name and lift and serve Jesus in the places where the wine has run out, and surely, 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 the day will come when nations shall beat their swords and plow, and into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. I believe that surely the day will come when nations refuse to take up sword against nation nor train for war anymore. I pray that with the eyes of our hearts open as broken bread and poured out wine, that we would be the vessels who choose to live into the reality of Dr. King's prophecy where freedom reigns and Jesus reigns in each of our lives. I pray that we would continue to work for the day when the table is spread and the feast of the Lord is for every person. Let us keep on keeping on until Jesus reigns from every village and every hamlet, from every city and every state. My brothers and sisters, crushed grapes, people of transformation, let us continue to work together to speed up the day when all of God's children, black people and white people, all races and ethnicities, male and female, straight and gay, Jews and Gentiles, Gen uh, Buddhists and Muslims will choose to join hands and at the name of Jesus, every knee bow, every tongue confess that he is Lord, he is Savior, he is mighty God, he is King of Kings, he is the Prince of Peace. And in the meantime, in the meantime, let us be the ones quick to notice and lift and name and bless all the places where we see Jesus present, where we see Jesus real, where we see Jesus still in the house healing and restoring and redeeming and resurrecting, where we see Jesus, oh Lord, in the small places pouring out miraculous rivers of grace upon grace upon grace. Hallelujah and amen. Let us pray. So, Lord God, we do thank you. We thank you, Lord, that you are still in the business of bringing forth miracles. And, Lord, in the places, Lord, we know in this old broken world there are places, even in our own lives, Lord, where it feels like the wine has run out. And so we just simply ask, Lord, that you would fill us anew. Fill us anew. Transform us anew, Lord that we would be your water jars, making a difference in the world. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.
I'm getting the benediction, what I wanted to say earlier is it is just wonderful to be with you today. Uh, like Katie, it, was, it took a lot to get out of the house <laughs> this morning. But to be with you today, it is manna. It's soul food. This worship, your worship is so beautiful. And so I thank you for the gifts of the bells and the gifts of the organ and the gifts of the choir, the gift of the children, the gift of each and every one of you. You do my heart good. So thank you. I need it to be with you today. And so now for the benediction. So when I see you, I see the beauty of God. When I see you, I see the light of Christ. When I see you, I see the peace of God. When I see you, I see joy upon joy upon joy. And so take your beauty and your light and your peace and your joy into a broken world and be God's water jar. And so may the love of God and the grace of Jesus Christ and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest and abide in each of us today and evermore. Amen and amen. amen.